the significance <clears throat> of Acts chapter 16 is that it is what scholars call Paul's second missionary journey. And in it we see Paul extending the geographic and ethnic range of his gospel message beyond the areas where Jews had substantial colonies and into the far more far-flung regions of uh, the vast Asian continent. Now this did not by any means indicate that Paul was no longer evangelizing Jews. But it did mean he would be dealing with Gentiles who had less familiarity with Jews and thus with the Jewish religion. A good way to think of it is that the Gentile population that Paul would now deal with was mostly pagan. While in his first missionary journey, a goodly portion of Gentiles he had spoken to were already God-fearers. So they had some knowledge of the Holy Scriptures, of Jewish history, of Jewish traditions and customs. Halakha. Well now, Paul was traveling with Silah, that Jewish representative of the Jerusalem Council who had been sent in an official capacity with a letter outlining the conditions by which a Gentile believer could become a member of the way, but without converting and becoming a Jew. And leaving Antioch and arriving in the area of Derby and Lystra, Paul recruited a young man of unusual faith and maturity to accompany him. Now we discussed at length last week that while many Christian commentators on Acts assume that Timothy was a Gentile believer, so Paul was requiring Timothy's circumcision, then it was a, a hypocritic, it was, it was very hypocritical, or as John Chrysostom said, it was Paul engaged in circumcision in order to abolish circumcision. But as I demonstrated to you, given the fact that we are specifically told that Timothy's mother was a Jew, then by rule of matrilineal descent, Timothy was born as a Jew, not, a, not as a Gentile. It's only that because Timothy's parents were fully assimilated into the Gentile culture, and because Timothy's father was a Gentile, that Timothy had not received the required circumcision on the eighth day of his life, as was the Torah commandment. So, <clears throat> since Paul and Silah were going to be dealing with a number of diff different ethnic groups in their journey, some Jewish, some Gentile, and since the subject of the gospel, that Yeshua was the Messiah and was also God, was already controversial, they certainly didn't need to add any side issues, such as this Jewish man, Timothy, not being circumcised. Now, there's no hint that Timothy resisted this. But I can also assure you, he didn't relish this procedure. At his age, it was painful and it was dangerous. And no doubt, many days passed afterward before he was physically able to go traveling with Paul. Now, as we saw in verses 4 and 5 of Acts chapter 16, Paul's first encounters were with synagogue congregations where he had already established a core group of believers. This was Paul's custom to occasionally go back and revisit established groups. But no doubt it was also so that Silah could see for himself what the Spirit through Paul had already accomplished with the Gentiles. Verses 6 through 8 show a great deal of direct intervention by the Holy Spirit, especially concerning where and where not the disciples should venture to spread this good news. In fact, we're told that the intervention prevented the group from going to the region of Bithynia. And instead, they found themselves at Troas, which was a, a, a port city. Well, let's reread a substantial portion 
of Acts chapter 16. We're going to start reading at verse 9. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, we're on page 1383. 1383. This is Acts chapter 16. We're going to start at verse 9. There a vision appeared to Shaul, to Paul, at night. A man from Macedonia was standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And as soon as he had seen the vision, we lost no time getting ready to leave for Macedonia, for we concluded that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. Now sailing from Troas, we made a straight run to Samothrace, the next day we went to Neapolis, and from there we went on to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that part of Macedonia. We spent a few days in this city. Then on Shabbat, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we understood a minyan meant. We sat down and began speaking to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in fine purple cloth. Purple cloth. She was already a God-fearer, and the Lord opened up her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. And after she and the members of her household had been immersed, she gave us this invitation. If you consider me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay in my house. And she insisted until we went. Well, once when we were going to the place where the Mignon gathered, we were met by a slave girl who had in her a snake spirit that enabled her to predict the future. Now, she earned a lot of money for her owners by telling fortunes. This girl followed Shaul and the rest of us, and she kept screaming, These men are servants of the god Ha'elyon. They're telling you how to be saved. And she kept this up day after day until Shaul, greatly disturbed, turned and said to the spirit, In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, I order you to come out of her. And the spirit did come out at that very moment. But when her owner saw that what had come out was any further prospect of profit for them, they seized Paul and Selah and dragged them to the market square to face the authorities. And bringing them to the judges, they said, these men are causing a lot of trouble in our city since they're Jews. What they are doing is advocating customs that are against the law for us to accept or practice since we are Romans. The mob joined in the attack against them, and the judges tore their clothes off them, ordered them that they be flogged. And after giving them a severe beating, they threw them in prison, charging the jailer to guard them securely. Upon receiving such an order, he threw them into the inner cell and clamped their feet securely between heavy, wood, heavy blocks of wood. Well, around midnight, Shaul and Selah were praying and singing hymns to God, while the other prison, prisoners listened attentively. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake which shook the prison to its foundations. All the doors flew open. Everyone's chains came loose. The jailer awoke. And when he saw the doors open, he drew his sword. He was about to kill himself, for he assumed that the prisoners had escaped. But Shaul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Calling for lights, the jailer ran in and he began to tremble. He fell down in front of Paul and Selah. Then leading them outside, he said, Men, what must I do to be saved? They said, Trust in the Lord Yeshua and you will be saved, you and your household. Whereupon they told him and everyone in his household the message about the Lord. Then, even at that late hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed off their wounds. And without delay, he and all his people were immersed. And after that, he brought them up to his house and set food in front of them. And he and his entire household celebrated their having come to trust in God. The next morning, the judges sent police officers with the order, release these men. The jailer told Shaul, the judges have sent word of, to release both of you. So come out, go on your way in peace. But Shaul, Shaul said to the officers, after flogging us in public, when we hadn't been convicted of any crime and our Roman citizens, they threw us in prison. Now they want to get rid of us secretly? Oh no. Let them come and escort us out themselves. The officers reported these words to the judges who became frightened when they heard Shaul and Selah were Roman citizens. They came and apologized to them. Then after escorting them out, they requested them to leave the city. 
From the prison, they went to Lydia's house, and after seeing and encouraging the brothers, they departed. At the port city of Troas, Paul had a vision. Now, it was not another contact with the Holy Spirit, but rather it was a vision of a man from Macedonia beckoning him to come to Macedonia and help us. The us, no doubt, meaning Macedonians in general. Paul knew immediately that the disciples ought to go. And of course, the Spirit-directed circumstances had put them at exactly the right place at the right time to catch a ship across the Aegean Sea in order to get to Macedonia. Now, in modern day terms, they would have been traveling to Europe. However, in Paul's day, the term Europe wouldn't have been used. Now, I want to point out something that can have practical application for us all. That includes the managers and administrators and business people among us. Paul's missionary journey displays a methodology of what I would call flexible planning. That is, his mindset is one of careful planning as well as maintaining an openness to let God move as he wills it. The balance between those two elements, planning versus divine guidance, will necessarily vary depending on the circumstance. And it will especially depend on whether the activity is secular or its ministry. Secular plans will tilt more towards human planning. Ministry will tilt more towards divine guidance. But either way, a believer must incorporate both elements into our goals, into our endeavors. Any error usually comes in misunderstanding how to apportion these two elements, or believing that only one is necessary. For instance, in secular business, long-range planning and doggedly sticking to that plan is usually the best course for success. But applying that same determination and rigid planning to ministry, that's a recipe for disaster. Just as no planning at all will end up in disappointment. At Seed of Abraham, it's common for people to ask me what my five-year plan is. And when I tell them I could fit it on a post-it note, they wonder how a person with a corporate management background could operate in such a way. And I can tell you frankly, <laughs> it's very hard for me to turn things over to God that I've been used to controlling. You know, I've always had a keen interest in the Apostle Paul because I feel like we have kindred temperaments. Paul is a natural control enthusiast. <laughs> Much prefer that to control freak. He is strong with his words, sometimes rising to the point of being rash, needlessly offending people. Yet his words are articulate, they're thought-provoking, they're full of facts and information. Paul can be defensive at times, but he's also always decisive. He doesn't fret over decision-making. And when Paul makes a decision or a pronouncement, there's no wavering. He's certain he's right. Paul looks towards the future. He doesn't live in the past. He's a crusader. Nothing energizes Paul like the cause of an underdog. And he is willing to take that cause to the bitter end no matter the cost. Paul is dedicated and sincere. What you see is what you get. But let me tell you something else about Paul. He doesn't do well on committees. He makes a much better dictator. Now that sure doesn't sound like the kind of a person who is sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Doesn't sound much like one who's suited to ministry for the God of Israel. Yet, here we see exactly that. Paul plans everything in advance. 
His missionary journeys were not accomplished willy-nilly. And I see no evidence that any human being could derail him from his plans. However, he is ready and eager to alter his well-thought-out plans in favor of God's direction anytime the Spirit confronts him. So the moral of the story for believers is plan, but always hold those plans lightly. To wander through life like a feather blown by unseen wisps of turbulent air is usually not the best policy. But to make rigid plans and to follow them through with tunnel vision towards the goal, that's usually not the best policy either. That famous beetle, one of my favorites really, and of all time, John Lennon, once said in a song, life is, what happening is, what, is what's happening while you're making plans. It's an important thing to keep in mind. I don't know how godly it is, but it's true. On the other hand, to say that our lives are God's responsibility and then to shun planning in general instead choosing to live moment by moment letting the future take care of itself no doubt will eventually lead to deep regrets bitter tears or even a resentment towards God not a great deal of success either we have our responsibility and God has his as regarding our lives it's a cooperative venture Paul is far from perfect, yet he shows an extraordinary ability, especially given his choleric temperament, to balance intelligent and practical strategic planning with a sensitive and obedient attitude towards the Holy Spirit. And this is very much on display here in these verses. Well, verse 10 reveals something of a surprise. Turns out, that Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, is with Paul and Timothy and Silas on this, uh, in Troas, in the port city of Troas. Now this verse is one of those we verses we discussed last time. That is, notice how Luke says, we lost no time getting ready to leave for Macedonia. See, what's important then is that at least starting at this point of Paul's second missionary journey, much of what we're going to read comes from an eyewitness. So it's not derived from interviews and, and documents. Thus we're going to see a bit more detail at times during the remainder of chapter 16 than we're used to seeing. Because by being a party to the missionary journey, what Luke saw was not filtered through someone else's worldview. I also think we can reasonably deduce that Luke gives us the best insight, this is important, into the historical Paul. Paul the person. And this is most valuable to us as we read Paul's many epistles that dominate the New Testament. Now speaking of epistles, it's on the western shore of the Aegean Sea where Paul will plant a number of believing congregations in places that we're more familiar with in terms of the New Testament books that are named for them. Because there we find the towns of Philippi, the book of Philippians, Corinth, the book of Corinthians, and Thessalonica, the book of Thessalonians, along with Berea, which Paul mentions, but he does not have a letter addressed to them as a Bible book. These places and their believing congregations are like the spokes of a wheel that emanate from their hub that's at the center, which is Ephesus. Now, since every commercial shipping vessel was wind-powered, then it was the winds that would determine the length and, and, and sometimes the route of a sea journey. It was 150 miles from Troas to Neapolis, which the four disciples accomplished in only two days. 
So the winds were favorable. However, those favorable winds worked against them. In the return trip, as we're informed in Acts 20, it took five days to make that same crossing in reverse. Now, from Neapolis, the next stop was Philippi, a city that was named after the father of Alexander the Great. Philippi was a Roman colony. Now, this term, Roman colony, had a distinct meaning. A Roman colony is one that operates under Roman religion and Roman law. Philippi was a logical stop for the well-organized Paul because it contained a substantial Jewish population, as did Thessalonica and Berea. So after a few days in Philippi, on Shabbat, the four disciples went to a place where they were told that people met for prayer. Now obviously this was referring to prayer to the God of Israel, for they would not have wanted to go to a, a prayer service to, to the pagan gods. Now, our complete Jewish Bible says in verse 13 that a minyan met there. Now, a minyan is a group of ten or more. Ten people is considered the minimum for a proper synagogue prayer service. Now, the word minyan does not actually appear in the Greek texts. And you won't find it in other English Bibles. Yet in Hebrew terminology, inserting the word minyan here makes sense. Especially in settings away from a synagogue. When it's time for one of the three daily prayers, Jews try to pray in a group. And that group must be ten or more. And by the way, Jews don't necessarily demand that all the participants in a minyan are Jews. I've been invited to ultra or, by ultra-Orthodox ultra Jews on a couple of occasions while flying to Israel to come and participate in prayer with them in order to form a minyan, which I happily did, because there weren't enough Jews on the plane to muster up ten. And yes, they full well knew I was a Gentile and a Christian. So it should not be surprising that in verse 14... We find that many people, uh, that, that many of the people at this place of prayer in Philippi were women and they were Gentiles and one was named Lydia, a dealer of purple cloth. Now Lydia was from Thyatira and this region was well known for their pur fine purple cloth expertise. The issue in this craft was the creation of the purple dye. And for Jews especially, the color purple played an important role in ritual items that involved threads and fabric. In fact, this particular shade of purple was called in Hebrew tekelet, tekelet. And it was required for the cloth partitions that separated the inner chambers of the tabernacle as well as for making uh, tzitzit and ephods. It was also used for the fringes that hung from the hems of certain ceremonial robes. Now this particular color was not easy to obtain. The most desired source of it came from the murex shellfish found along the eastern Mediterranean coastline. However, in Thyatira, this dye was made from the fluid of a plant, the matter root. So all in all, it's not surprising that Lydia had formed an association with the local Jews as they would have been among her best customers. Now Lydia believed Paul's message of salvation in Christ. Now Lydia was already a god fearer so she had a good basis to understand Paul's teachings on Yeshua. Lydia must have been the head of her household because we're told in verse 15 that when she was immersed so then was her entire household. Perhaps she was a widow, maybe divorced, we don't know. But let me explain something. This is going to help you not only in understanding what's happening here, but it's also customary to this day in Middle Eastern families. The head of the household is revered and powerful. They lead and can make binding decisions for household members. 
in a way that's become obsolete in the West. Therefore, whatever religion the head of the house subscribes to, the remainder of the household automatically follows it. So, even in regards to Lydia's household being baptized, do not get a mental picture of all those people having a heartfelt and sincere belief in Yeshua as Lord and Savior. The head of the house was baptized and began to follow Christ, so it was customary that the remainder of those in the household were obligated to do the same. They had no choice. I want to say that in another way. Whatever religion the head of the household adopts automatically becomes the religion for the entire house, household. For a household member to refuse to conform, that would be the height of rebellion. It would cause an enormous rift. Now in just a few more verses, in verse 31, understanding how this custom works will help us to understand what was actually taking place when we were told this. They, meaning the disciples, said, trust in the Lord Yeshua and you will be saved, you and your household. This verse has actually led to a Christian doctrine among some congregations that says if the head of the house, usually a male, will accept Yeshua, then God will deem the entire household is saved as a group, group salvation, not individual. This is, a, this is a misunderstanding. Rather, it is only that in some ancient and modern day societies, the household merely accepts whatever the leader of the home decides. It's more about social family dynamics than religion and actual belief. Well, now a believer, the gracious Lydia, offers hospitality to Paul and his three companions. Now, hospitality was the supreme virtue not only in the Middle East, but in most of the known world at that time. Paul and his friends were not staying in convenient roadside inns as they traveled. They either slept under the stars or in the homes of folks who offered them hospitality. So we shouldn't be especially surprised that a well-to-do businesswoman would offer her home for a place to stay. Now in verse 16, Luke re-injects himself into the story. As he says, we were going to a certain place of prayer. When suddenly, the disciples encounter this slave girl who has a snake spirit in her. And her owners made good use of her occult abilities by charging folks to have their fortunes told to them. So Luke was eyewitness to this event. But before we continue with that story, I want to make a point. Over and over, we've been informed that this is on Shabbat, that the congregation gathered at synagogue, and it was on Shabbat when the Torah was read. But realize that while Shabbat was the big day when most pious Jews went for communal prayer and worship, it was not the only day for communal prayer, worship, and teaching. In the Mekeltah Vayasa, we read this revealing report that upholds what is known from tradition and other Jewish sources. And it reads like this. It was for this reason that the elders and the prophets instituted the reading from the Torah for the Sabbath and for the second and fifth days of the week. How so? They read on the Sabbath and then they skip only one day after the Sabbath. Then they read on the second day and skip the third and fourth. And then they read again on the fifth day and skip the day preceding Sabbath. Thus it's true that in Yeshua's day, those who were the strictest followers of the Torah went to the synagogue three days per week to meet and hear the Torah read. That was on Shabbat and on what we would call Monday and Thursday. Orthodox Jews today go daily to pray and read the Torah. Now, for the demon-possessed slave girl. Seems like almost every English Bible translation translates this verse a little bit differently. Some don't say anything, interestingly, about a snake spirit contrary to our complete Jewish Bibles. 
many of them will just refer to a spirit of divination. But in fact, the original text says that the girl had a pithana spirit. Translating that to snake is okay, but leaving out any reference to a snake is not okay because we lose the impact. Further, the Greek pythana most literally does not mean snake. It means python. So the best literal translation to English is having the spirit of a python. Now Strabo, who is a, a Greek philosopher and historian who died at about the same time Yeshua was born, says that the python was the serpent that got, guarded the Delphic oracle whose name was Pythia. The Delphic oracle wasn't actually just one person. It was a prestigious office that was held by a succession of Greek women. She could perform as a priestess at the shrine of Delphi and this priestess was probably the most powerful woman among the Greeks. In any case, what's being referred to here in these passages in Acts is a slave girl who is said to have carried the same spirit of Pythia in her as did the famous and revered oracle at Delphi. So she was quite an attraction to these Greeks and they paid good money to this slave girl's owners to have her tell them their future. There is no doubt that this girl was demon possessed and that what happened was quite real. So knowing this helps us to understand what comes next. The girl kept following Paul and the disciples around screeching, these men are the servants of God most high, they're telling you how to be saved. In other words, as annoying as she was, she was telling the truth. But after a while, Paul grew tired of this self-serving nonsense and never-ending clamor and exercised the offending demon in the name of Yeshua. Now, needless to say, her owners were horrified. And they were furious at Paul. All that profit just went down the drain. So the men grabbed Paul and Selah and took them before the local authorities who were quite understanding for these businessmen. And of course, rather than accuse Paul and Selah of what was really happening, ruining their business, they made some claim about Paul and Selah being Jews who were causing all kinds of disruptions and commotion and upsetting everyone. Well, so far, the only upset people seem to be the businessmen who owned that slave girl. But the accusation to incite riots was a sensitive one in the Roman Empire. It's taken very seriously. Jews were notorious riot starters. What comes next derives from an incorrect assumption that the town magistrates made. Behind the accusation that Paul and Salah were Jews is that they must not be Roman citizens. Paul and Salah were in a town of mostly Gentiles where Roman citizenship was the norm. It was rare for a Jew to be a Roman citizen. So rare that such a possibility wasn't even considered by the townspeople. Early in our study of the book of Acts, we discussed that Paul's status as a Roman citizen, something that is regularly brought up in the New Testament, was indeed out of the ordinary. And that his citizenship could be traced to his father's family, who apparently were Jewish aristocrats in a high enough position that some high Roman government official awarded them this special status. So Paul was born into his Roman citizenship and he had led a privileged life because of it. This is why he had little trouble standing up to local politicians, uh, other aristocrats, even kings. He knew how to handle himself. He knew the right words to say. And he knew his legal rights 
as a Roman citizen and he knew how to demand justice. I mean, God had picked exactly the right man for the job as the lead evangelist to the Gentiles of the Roman Empire. Well, for whatever reason, Luke and Timothy escaped the notice of the authorities and they weren't subject to being prosecuted. I suspect it was because Luke was obviously a Gentile and because Timothy probably looked like a Gentile due to his physical features he inherited from his Gentile father. Paul in Salah no doubt looked Semitic. Well the crowd reacted as if in a feeding frenzy and the judges acted in accordance with the wishes of the crowd. Paul and Salah were beaten, thrown into jail. I mean, how dare non-Roman citizens tell Roman citizens what their religion ought to be? These men needed to be taught a lesson. So they were chained into stocks. But it's the pattern of the Lord that when he decides that human justice goes against his will, often he'll overturn the rulings of men. Around midnight, as Paul and Sila were praying, the earth began to roll and rumble. And it was violent enough that the chains fell off of Paul and Silas and all the others in prison with them. Even more, the cell doors flew open. Now the startled jailer was jostled out of a sound sleep to find that his jail was open. Well, he decided to kill himself as the only honorable thing to do because he knew that was going to be his fate anyway. He figured that surely all the prisoners would have gleefully thanked their lucky stars and run off into the night. But instead, he heard a reassuring voice from inside the darkness of the jail cells telling him not to harm himself. They're all still there. Well, the awestruck jailer fell down before Paul and Selah and asked, what must I do to be saved? Now, it's hard to know exactly what was in that jailer's mind when he spoke those words. I mean, perhaps the jailer had heard Paul and Selah speak about the way of salvation as they roamed the streets of Philippi, not knowing very much about what it even meant, but he was so impressed with the countenance and the courage of these two men. He wanted whatever it is they had. Paul explains to the astonished jailer that faith in Yeshua will save him and all his household. Now we've already discussed what this meant in the context of the times we're dealing with. Now since we know that Luke was not in jail with Paul and Selah, he's summarizing whatever he's been told about this incident. And detail is no doubt lacking from it. Well the jailer has a few ways only a few ways to thank Paul and Selah that doesn't involve simply releasing them, which would have resulted in his execution. So he responds by washing their wounds, providing them as much comfort as the circumstances will allow. But we're also told that right away, the jailer and his entire household were immersed. Seems that the jailer took great personal risk and he brought Paul and Selah to his own home. Somewhere nearby, Paul and Silah baptized them all. Following that, they ate a meal together. Now notice that they had gone home with Lydia, the God-fearing Gentile. Now they do the same with this unnamed jailer. Without the ruling of the Jerusalem council, without Peter's encounter with God and with Cornelius that made it clear that Gentiles could be ritually clean, these two scenes with Jewish men eating in the homes of Gentiles and accepting their hospitality would have been impossible. Well, the next morning after the earthquake event, the town magistrates sent men to release Paul and Sila, no doubt feeling that these Jews had been put into their place. The scars of their flogging would be permanent. And the humiliation and pain of being in jail ought to have done the trick. Paul the Crusader is not about to let this matter rest and just be happy the ordeal's over. He wants the men who wrongly did this to them to own up to their offense and apologize in person. So now he chooses to reveal that he is in fact a Roman citizen 
who did not get a trial. Instead, he was summarily flogged and thrown into jail. This is something that is strictly against Roman law. Well, the magistrates were startled. I mean, they were afraid when Paul's words reached them. They themselves could lose their prestigious positions if the provincial governor heard about this injustice perpetrated upon a Roman citizen. So indeed, they swallowed their pride. They went to personally face Paul and Sila. What they said exactly to the disciples isn't disclosed, but they did ask them to leave the city. Now, this matter had become too public for the townspeople not to know what was going on, but that didn't change anything. The people of Philippi were resentful that this Jew had deprived them of this special girl with the python spirit in her that told them the future. And it also, no doubt, brought this city considerable pride and notoriety. The businessmen were still out their profitable endeavor forever. And there was still a bad taste in the mouths of the locals from being told that the religion of the Jews was right, but their own Roman religion was wrong. So the magistrates asked, probably politely, the disciples leave the city. Paul and company complied and afterward went back to Lydia's house, probably to recuperate from their ordeal. Well, after meeting, meeting with many of the believers there, they moved on and we're going to follow the disciples to their next location next week in Acts chapter 17.